Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young here on this Friday with a little bit of K-State basketball to talk because yesterday we were discussing the release of the Big 12 opponents and how the scheduling is going to work out this upcoming season so we know home and away how to look in the Big 12 for K-State. But today we got to hear from Jerome Tang for the first time this summer, and he was kind of able to do it for the first time since he's been at K-State in the month of June, talk about a complete roster. He's got every slot filled. He noted that it's the first time that's happened since he's been at K-State. And I think overall, the theme of Jerome Tang's press conference today was versatility. Doesn't matter where you want to grab that word from. It just seems to ring true all across the board, whether you're talking about the players individually and the positions they can play, they're versatile in that. The shooting, you have a large number of guys that can do it. That helps you be a more diverse and versatile team on the floor. And then the depth. He praised the depth in a couple of different ways. David Castillo was brought up with some glowing praise. Uh, but I'll ask you, D.Y., what was your most notable takeaway from what Jerome Tang said earlier today? If you're a KSO subscriber, uh, it didn't surprise you or it didn't catch you completely off guard that they're – comments about David Castillo. So if you're not, you should be and sign up as soon as you're done watching or, or listening to this segment. But uh, yeah, glowing remarks about David Castillo. I think that, you know, even if you did know that that was starting to have rumblings behind the scenes, some validity to that, that's still going to kind of slap you in the face when you hear it out loud. I mean, the I don't want to say hyperbole, but the kind of remarks that were used to – describe his first month on campus saying sometimes he walks out of you know the ice basketball facility this is Jerome Tang thinking I don't know how I don't start David Castillo he said that's happened a few times in this one month that Castillo has been in Manhattan and I don't think that you can be any more stronger with praise than that so just how bold he was and how unafraid, because sometimes coaches and Jerome Tang included, um, they feel that way about a player, but they don't want to say it out loud because um, then expectations probably can sometimes become unrealistic. Or two, it goes to the player's head or they don't handle it in a mature way. But obviously, one of the strong traits and characteristics of Castillo is his maturity, um, is his you know presence. Um, a guy that, you know, I've it's kind of been bantered around the water cooler by, by folks in the know that would say he's got like future captain, leader written all over him, a face of the program type guy. So um, that that's another, you know, you know, awesome compliment for him that they can feel that way about him and also not be afraid to say about him in a public manner because – they know it's not going to offend the rest of the locker room. They know that he can handle it, and they're not afraid of the expectations that might come with it. I think that's uh, a pretty strong statement all around be because of that. But, you know, some of the other things that stood out, um, just another thing, he must really feel like he has a mentally strong and mature locker room too, I think, because he was unafraid, Jerome Tang, I mean, to also speak about some of the elephants in the room, so to speak, too. Like he, you know, Doug McDaniel's been in Manhattan for a month. Coleman Hawkins has only been there a couple of days. And he spoke very freely, Jerome Tank did, about the volatility of their play sometimes. He, he brought that up unprovoked. Like sometimes they're the best players in college basketball. And then some players, sometimes they disappear and you wonder where it is and they need it at that consistent level kind of know what you're going to get. And that's exa exactly how every smart basketball mind kind of explains or describes those two. So it's it's very fair. But to hear Jerome Tank kind of talk about it in a public manner, in a public setting with media, and have it be fair game means he's not afraid of Doug McDaniel seeing that, hearing that, and it becoming an issue. He's not afraid of Coleman Hawkins seeing that, hearing that, and it becoming an issue. So just – He's not afraid of David Castillo hearing all this praise about him and becoming an issue. Like he 
Hasn't been around these guys for a long, long time yet, but you can tell there's things that he's willing to say about these players this year already, I think, that he probably wasn't at times last year. Yeah, that's true, and I also think that him just kind of admitting, hey, there are some some holes and some things that we, we get really high and we get really down sometimes with how things go. I think that's uh, probably a little bit more growth on his end too and just uh, how upfront he is and, and how understanding he is. And it also probably signifies that he feels like he does have a team where that's the kind of thing that'll work, where he doesn't have to dance around any sensitivities and say, oh, things have been great. You know, this is this is kind of what we expect to get things started during the summer. Uh, he can be a little bit more open and honest. And I, I look at this team being built in a way that it's got guys that have that mentality of, okay, I, I think I'm pretty talented, but if I'm doing something wrong, I can handle being called out for it, and it's going to propel me to be better. I think we saw maybe at points last year that this team just didn't have the makeup to be like that, and so it had to be handled differently. Um, but certainly it seems like there are guys that are – they're all, you know, a little bit more experienced of, of playing and having a heavier role on their shoulder, which is also significant. We talked about that a lot with last year's team. Just so many guys were in roles that they would never had to do before or weren't meant for them. This year's team, you've got a bunch of guys that come in that they were either the best or the second best player on their previous team or wherever they were at. And I think that's uh, something significant to, to kind of take away from everything, too. Yeah, the fact that he's hasn't had – well, at least, I mean, this is only a first or second time. So we'll see what happens the rest of the way. Things can change. But didn't have to dance around those sensitivities, as you said. Wasn't really worried about potentially hurting someone's feelings or, you know, glowing about someone so much that they would lose focus. Um, just those are things that were refreshing for me to kind of see, to kind of hear. And Drew, I'm saying himself too, right? Um, and obviously it's harder to admit these things while you're still in the fires of a season, but, you know, since the season ended, I think on multiple occasions, he's been free, freely speaks. And I like that about your own thing more so than a lot of coaches say last year wasn't what we wanted. Like, I know that doesn't sound like a saying a ton, but like, there's not many coaches that actually admit that publicly. Like last year wasn't what we wanted last year wasn't what we expected it's not what our fans deserved i mean you just don't hear that often from coaches and i think that's refreshing i understand why he didn't do it during the seasons because you don't want to lose you your, the guys that you're still trying to get to show up for you on a daily basis i get that but to kind of now have him reflect honestly and transparently um it's cool to see kind of where his head is at and how he would have defined last year, because obviously they did miss the NCAA tournament. And I can't imagine that, you know, in Jerome Tang's career, how he sees it. And I know they missed it a few times at Baylor too, in the first handful of seasons, but I just don't think that that's, I think that's the NIT isn't the bar that he wants to clear. Right. I, I you know, people have said, you know, the Kansas state program, let's say out of five years, if you go, to the NCAA tournament three times, you feel like you've really accomplished something. I don't think Jerome Tang feels good about that. I I think he shoots much higher. So if he were to miss the NCAA tournament twice in five years, I think that would upset him greatly and probably be disappointing to himself. So he he views this thing as much differently, and that's why he, you know, I guess defines last year the way he does so transparently now. And and I like what he, like I said, I like that he's not worried about this team being sensitive. He's not worried about this team not having the maturity to handle success or, or positive praise. And, and and like what he said about what he's seen so far in the month, I like to have some of this written down over here, but he's he feels like he has guys that have really embraced competition and guys that are really passionate about the game of basketball. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, he and he made it clear in there that like last year was not, what they expected or what they want or how they'll kind of tolerate things. And I think that was significant. Now, one of the other things he talked about was when he was discussing Doug McDaniel and what their approach was in building the roster this year. And I, Drew and I talked about it quite a bit. There were two things that stood out about how they built this roster this year. And, and two of them all bring up uh, kind of pieces and things that I've noted uh, 
and we'll we'll talk about it a little bit. But the first one was they're trying to build this depth to where you're not overturning a roster every single season and you're having to replace with X amount of different players. Well, this year they kind of did the thing where you can dip into the portal and you can get guys with two years of eligibility left three years of eligibility left, or, hey, this is just kind of our rental, but it's going to prop up our roster. And he talked about that wasn't necessarily an intentional plan. Um, They just identified the best players and wanted them to come and play at K-State, and that's ultimately what they ended up doing. You know, uh, I'd love to tell you that we sat around and said we want to balance, you know, the the roster with the number of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, but – we just wanted the best players that fit who we were about. And um, as soon as Doug put his name in the portal, we thought he was the best point guard out there. What What do you think of that approach where maybe it wasn't necessarily at the front of their mind, hey, let's try and get guys that have extra eligibility. Let's just continue to attack and get the best players possible. And he did admit later on, he also said, like, when you're in the portal and you're trying to get guys – most of those guys are thinking, and you're also thinking, if it goes well, they're only here one year and they're gone no matter how much eligibility they'd have left. Yeah, that's the issue, right? Like, he's right. In an ideal world, you want some roster balance so you don't have to overturn as much each year. It makes it less of a burden, right? Because what do they have to do? They had 10 new players, if you count David Castillo, um, for this year's team because they had three return, only three. So 10 new guys. I mean, that's... You know, you, one, you got to thread the needle for some success. Two, you got to basically build chemistry overnight, cohesion overnight. And three, like that takes a while. Like that takes a lot of hard work. To get 10 guys, you're probably missing on 20 or 25 too. So it's not like, hey, we just recruited 10 guys. No, they probably recruited 40 to get 10. Um, That's just the way recruiting works. So it's a lot of work. You'd like to have it, the burden to undertake be lesser than that on a yearly basis they didn't have that luxury this year but guess what you still might not have it next year he's right you just never know because one if this works out well this guy's gone in a year this guy's gone in a year or two like (laughs) upset feelings we just talked about we didn't think that would be a problem this team but you never know a guy can transfer as many times as he wants now he could be out in a year the third like you just when you it's an ideal world you have that roster balance but there is a lot of unexpected like unexpected things happen on a basketball roster right now there is how many big 12 teams are bringing back 10 guys from last year's roster i don't know if there's one maybe iowa state yeah uh it's just it's not normal. Uh, you're trying to recruit over them. They're looking out for themselves or going to the NBA. They want it to be a, a one-year excursion. It's just hard to look at it that way. And if you do, you know, you, you would have it, right? So because all these players are looking at it as a one-year deal, you might as well do it as a coaching staff as well. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a it's a good point, and I guess now we'll uh, see how it ends up working out for K State with what they've done this year, and honestly beyond because that's kind of the crux of what was being talked about there. Okay, uh, mention versatility off the top, and this is where Jerome Tang kind of talked about a handful of different things, but one of them was the way the roster is built and the length and the different ways that guys can play on the floor, it's going to give them the ability to play different styles. The great thing about the roster is that we can play a variety of ways. You know, we can play big, we can play small, and, uh, you know, we could be a really good zone team if we choose to. And I know we're going to be a really good man-to-man team. And um, so I, I really feel like our, our roster is set up in a way that we could, whatever problem is thrown at us by another team, we have – the guys that could match and answer those problems. So they he feels good about what they can do, but interesting that when he was talking about it, he focused a little bit more on the defensive end. I feel like that's the area where a lot of people might still harbor some concern about K-State basketball this coming season. 
uh, because they're, you know, worried, oh, can, you know, Coleman Hawkins do this if he's having to play here? Is Doug McDaniel going to be able to defend? There's a lot of that chatter out there. I'm not as worried about that. Uh, but after hearing Jerome Tang, what are your thoughts on how K-State can be not only versatile on what they do offensively, but on the defensive side of the ball where they've proven to be really good under Jerome Tang? They'll always be a good man-to-man team. Just like that's what you just said at the end there. I mean, with the problems of missing the NCAA tournament last year, I think it was still like a top 25, top 30 defense in the country. And that's when people said, you know, Arthur Kluma picked and chose when he played defense. Tyler Perry can't defend, you know, the, those types of things. And you look up and they're still a really good defensive team. And that's a credit to Jerome Tang, Dream Dowling, Yurk Malagy. Um, as long as, you know, that, that core is together, I'm not – going to be worried about this team on the defensive end. Um, it was always about let's let's get some more firepower on offense. Let's get some more answers on offense. Let's get some more shooting at offense. And I think they did all of those things. So my concern level is probably non-existent when it comes to the defensive side. Um, but I like Coleman Hawkins to get a little bit healthier so he can move a little better and guard to three. Um, and, yeah, because that would – uh, as much as I don't think man-to-man defense is going to be a problem and Jerome Tank doesn't either, that makes your man-to-man defense even better if that's the case. And I think there's a pathway for that to happen. Do I think this could be a really good zone team? I do. Because if you're playing Coleman Hawkins at the three, George Orr at the four, and you got an Onyenzo at the five, uh, you got a freaking ton of length uh, to disrupt everything. You can get in almost any passing lane that you want. Um, you know, th- those pockets that are typically open – against a zone defense aren't necessarily open against this zone defense if you have that kind of length because of the amount of ground that you can cover. And that might even include a longer C.J. Jones at the two, right? Right. I, I've i had some, I wouldn't say questions or doubts, but, you know, I've had some times where I ponder, because he mentioned it too, Jerome Tank did, that they can play small if they want. I'm like, you know, how, how does that work? Obviously, if Doug McDaniel's at the one, he's small. But, I mean, C.J. Jones is I – mean, he would be a small three. So who has to play the two if they're a small two? You know, working your way down. And who plays the four when you're playing small? I mean, your five when you play small is probably Coleman Hawkins, I would imagine, or a chore or chore. Um, if you're playing small, it's, it's one of those. Or you play your gunner at the five and a chore, a chore, and Coleman Hawkins are both off the floor, then who do you go with? Because you're like, well, we have Brendan Hawson, Max Jones, CJ Jones, Doug McDaniel. I mean, what do you do you have enough there to play small? What I will say is the emergence of David Castillo as a legitimate threat to play, and I think that's becoming – sounds more viable and viable by the day. Um, that's probably – what's happened in the last month that unlocks an extra ability to play smaller. Yeah, the Castillo stuff should be really exciting to people. The fact that that was a guy that you have all of these different players that are in Manhattan now that they've been able to see, and that Jerome Tang still felt like, hey, this true freshman coming in, I can still boast about him. That that should be really exciting for K-State fans. Because I was I was high and excited for David Castillo when they initially landed him. But then you see the roster they put together, like, I don't know if David Castillo is really going to need to be uh, a piece this season, but he seems like he's come in and maybe tried to force the hand of the staff. So it'll be interesting what plays out over the next couple of months. One area where David Castillo is going to likely help K-State, if not this year, but down the road, is in the area of shooting. But Castillo isn't one of the only guys that's coming in that is going to be a good shooter and better than what K-State had last year. This was the other big thing that I've talked about constantly with Drew is that it seemed like every time we did a a transfer portal commit video, we're like, oh, this guy, if he was on the team last year, would have had the highest three-point percentage on the team. There are six players that K-State brought in that if they were on last season's team would have had the highest three-point percentage. That would be Doug McDaniel, C.J. Jones, Brendan Hazen, uh, Max Jones, Achor Achor, and Coleman Hawkins. Well, Jerome Tang talked about the shooting because I asked him today if it was intentional to get better at shooting, and he gave really the answer that I was kind of looking for and and made sure it was known that, like, 
the staff understood that they got good looking shots last year. Uh, very intentional. Um, you know, when you break down uh, the numbers, there's a shot quality uh, stat that people keep and um, they divide it up on the graph that was, you know, bad shots or tough shots and bad shot makers. Um, it was tough shots or bad shots and good shot makers. Then there was um, good shots and good shot makers. And then there were good shot and bad shot makers. And we are, our shot quality was right there with um, all, you know, the top 10 offenses in the country, right? Like the, the shots we were getting, we just didn't make shots. And um, I, I still felt like we had good shooters. And for some other reason, for some reason, we did not make the shots when we had them that, that were open. So he, he references shot quality there, which is uh, a tool that coaches and, and players can use. Uh, I've been following shot quality like – since they kind of got off the ground, they were posting just kind of fascinating information. It would show after games and be like, hey, here is what we think the score should have been based on shot quality versus what it actually ended up happening. And I think it was pretty clear to even just the naked eye last year and anybody that has any lack of basketball knowledge, K-State got a lot of good looks last season. They just, and like Jerome said, for, for whatever reason, they didn't have the horses to make the shots last season. That should not be a part of the problem this year. They should have the guys that can make shots on any given night. Yeah, C.J. Jones, his shot really had an uptick this past year, so I'll be interested to see how much that is sustainable. Uh, I'm, a, I'm hopeful and excited for that to be the case, but um, because he has had improvement every year, uh, but uh, – Things you have to keep an eye on, but a really good shooter last year. Again, a chore, chore, same thing. Like a really big jump. How sustainable is the jump? We'll see. The volume went up and the percentage went up. Sometimes not always pretty. Sometimes it is. So those are two that I'll be intrigued to see where those percentages lie this season. Brennan Hawson, elite shooter. Doug McDaniel, elite shooter. Coleman Hawkins, another one where it kind of took that bounce. Um, up, but I think that's one that is also can be sustainable, but you got to keep an eye on it, of course. So stuff like that will be interesting to track where David Castillo's shot is as a true freshman. Um, Max Jones, I think that one's been a little slept on, and I thought Jerome Tang's response about him kind of made me feel even more bold about it. He's probably, like Brandon Hawson and like Doug McDaniel, the guard – that has had a consistent shot making ability from beyond the arc that should not be discounted. And I like that he keeps going up levels and his production does not plateau. So I think he could be a sleeper as well. Max Jones. Yeah. I, Max Jones is kind of the guy that uh, he, he's one of the players that when they landed him uh, was really a good highlight of what I thought K-State should be doing. Uh, more often in the portal is finding those guys that can kind of tie the roster together. And he certainly seems like that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see because he got an individual shout out today from Jerome Tank. So those to me were some of the most notable things. Again, I just think this is going to be a K-State basketball team that we talked about the, the scheduling aspect yesterday. It's in a really good spot for him. Now we know that the roster, it's got the talent. It seems to have the versatility that you need to be a team that can win a majority of your games in a 20 game conference schedule that the big 12 is going to throw your way now. And uh, it should be pretty exciting for K-State, especially as we get closer and closer to the season, hearing more about them. And uh, I know Jerome Tang kind of said, Hey, the whole roster is going to be in Manhattan by July 7th. Uh, the only guy that may not be there yet is David Gasson. He's still got obligations for the Netherlands national team. But outside of that, everybody's here. They're working together, and it seems to be going uh, at least well from a developmental standpoint and looking and saying, yeah, we got we got exactly what we wanted if you're Jerome Tang. You say, we they finally got the dudes this year. I think last year they had to kind of lie to themselves about that. This year you look around, and there's no doubt that they have high-quality players that could play at any school they wanted to in the country. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good time to be a Kansas State fan, right? You're getting ready to walk up on a football season that where you have Avery Johnson, 
Dylan Edwards, DJ Giddens, Chase Brown, those types on, on the offensive side of the ball. A defense that'll probably continue to just be steady with some really blossoming young pieces, especially on the defensive line. That'll be exciting to watch. Uh, you don't get Utah at home and you don't get Iowa State at home, but you probably get the other three contenders that you would say, Oklahoma State, Arizona, and Kansas at home. So a fun schedule um, in that respect, I believe, where you get three of the top five teams, three of the top four other teams that you are in the top five at home. I think Iowa State's overrated, so I wouldn't give it that to them. Um, I would probably put Texas Tech over Iowa State, but in case they didn't get Texas Tech at home either. Um, so that's interesting. A really exciting football season that could result in a Big 12 championship. You got your star boy there, Avery Johnson, to watch. And now he's got his friend in town, Dylan Edwards, to pair back there with DJ Giddens. Very exciting. And on the heels of that, and especially when it's double season when you got basketball going too, you just landed one of the best point guards in America, Doug McDaniel. You landed one of the best recruits in America with David Castillo. It's, it's already garnering rave reviews from the coaching staff. You brought in probably a top five, top ten transfer. If people don't lie to themselves when you're talking about Coleman Hawkins, a potential top ten defensive big, and you got an Onyenso with some upside on the offense. A George Chor crushed KU last year. He's had his flashes. We have some of these other players that we're talking about that have a chance to be better than what people think. And a Max Jones or a, um, a CJ Jones or a Brennan Hazen by fall. We'll see what happens with him. David Gasson is back. Uh, a very intriguing team that, you know, if things go at their absolute best, also competes for a Big 12 championship. If we've, as you said, we just talked on our last show about the schedule. Like, as a season ticket holder, you're getting more value than what you're paying for this year. That'll be fun. Bramlett should be hopping with all those games. They're really, we looked at the conference schedule, the home games. There really was only like one or two. We were like, eh. And everyone else was, Super exciting. I'm looking forward to like circle on your calendar type game. So it's going to be a fun year across football basketball for that. And for that matter, a good time to be on KSO if you aren't already um, first month for a dollar. Yeah, that's the uh, that's the good pitch right there. All right, that'll do it for us rounding out the week. But big things on the horizon for K-State because Monday is when Lincoln Cure, the five-star tight end from Goodland, Will announce his commitment. Uh, KSO will be there for you and uh, have all the fallout from that, good or bad, uh, with whatever happens. But if you want some insight, head over to KSO and get it checked out. And uh, we'll have plenty of other K-State news and notes coming your way the rest of the weekend. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. Back again next week with a full slate for you. <laughs>